The screencast discusses the anatomy of long bone and the microscopic anatomy of compact bone. Both topics can be found in Chapter 6 of your textbook. This screencast was designed to help you achieve the following objectives. Describe the anatomy of a long bone. Describe the microscopic anatomy of compact bone tissue. Let's now talk about the gross anatomy of a long bone. For our discussion, we'll be looking at this figure. This illustration shows the humerus of the arm. The humerus is that single bone found in the brachial region of the body. This figure is from another book, but it is similar to figure 6.3 in your book. Recall that long bones are longer than they are wide. All of the bones of your appendages are long bones, except the carpals of the wrist and the tarsals of the ankle. The shaft, or middle portion of the long bone, is referred to as the diaphysis. I've highlighted the diaphysis here. Let's magnify it to continue to discuss the structures or anatomy of the diaphysis. The diaphysis consists mainly of compact bone. There's an outer thick layer of compact bone, and there is a very thin inner layer of spongy bone, although you can't really see it in this figure. The diaphysis is surrounded or covered by the periosteum, which is a connective tissue membrane. The periosteum is secured to the compact bone by little sharpies or perforating fibers. Remember that bone is an organ. It contains osseous tissue. Osseous tissue is living tissue, so it contains cells. These cells need a blood supply. So there are various nutrient arteries that extend into the bone to provide nutrients, oxygen, other substances, and also to remove carbon dioxide and other waste products. The center of the diaphysis is a hollow area or space called a medullary cavity. That medullary cavity is lined with a layer of connective tissue cells and bone forming cells that are collectively called an endosteum. The medullary cavity in infants and small children contains red bone marrow. Red bone marrow is responsible for the production of red and white blood cells or hematopoiesis. In infants and toddlers, the body is growing so quickly that the, all of the medullary cavity of the long bones is utilized for hematopoiesis or red and white blood cell production. However, as the infant or child ages, much of that red bone marrow in the medullary cavities of long bone is converted to yellow bone marrow, which consists mainly of fat. And in adult, only the proximal epiphyses of the femurs and the humeruses or humeri contain red bone marrow. Most hematopoiesis in an adult occurs in the flat bones. The two enlarged ends of a long bone are re referred to as epiphyses. You have a proximal epiphysis and you have a distal epiphysis. In contrast with the diaphysis, the epiphysis contains mainly spongy bone with a thin layer of compact bone surrounding it. Also in contrast to the diaphysis, Articular cartilage, rather than the periosteum, covers the uh, epiphysis. Articular cartilage is hyaline cartilage. Its function is to minimize friction at the joint surface. As we age, the articular cartilage tends to become brittle and break down, exposing the underlying bone. This leads to pain and inflammation and a, a condition 
known as arthritis or inflammation of the articulations or joints. Long bones also exhibit various surface features. Some of these features are projections and processes that extend out from the bone. Others are depressions and cavities or indentations. Many of these surface features represent sites of attachment for tendons of skeletal muscles, ligaments that attach one bone to another, or articulating surfaces at a joint. There are also holes and canals which allow for the passage of blood vessels and nerves. These surface features have various categories and names. We identified many of them and gave names to many of them in lab. I will not require you to identify them or name them in the lecture component of the class. However, I thought in a lecture about gross anatomy that we should at least acknowledge the general function of bone markings. This is a figure from your book that illustrates and describes the various bone markings. Again, I am not going to require you to identify or to define any of the bone markings in lecture. Now that we have discussed the gross anatomy of long bone, let's now turn our attention to the microscopic anatomy of compact bone. For the purposes of our discussion, we will be looking at this figure here. This figure is similar to the figure in your book, figure 6.5. However, I think this, this figure is superior, so even though this is from another book, for our discussion, I'm going to use this figure. If you recall, little holes in the periosteum allow blood vessels and nerves to extend into the compact bone. Those nerves and blood vessels pass perpendicular to the long axis of the bone in these canals called Volkmann's canals or perforating canals. The Volkmann's canals lead to a second type of canal called the central canal or Haversian canal that extends the length of the bone along the long axis of the bone. These central canals or Haversian canals are at the center of the basic unit of compact bone, which is called an osteon or Haversian system. So let us now discuss further the anatomy of an osteon. So if we were to take a pie-shaped section from an osteon, we'd have a structure that looks something like that. And I'm going to use that specific section or figure to discuss the anatomy of an osteon. So one of the things that sort of jumps out at you when you look at a osteon under the microscope are the concentric rings that surround the central canal. These concentric rings are called lamellae, and the lamellae basically contain the extracellular matrix of osseous tissue. Recall that osseous tissue or bone tissue is a connective tissue, so it contains extracellular matrix. That extracellular matrix is about 25% water, 50% calcium phosphate salts, which accounts for its hardness and allows it to uh, bear a weight. The matrix also consists about 25% collagen fibers, which gives bone some flexibility and also gives it tensile strength or the or allows it to resist forces that uh, that would tend to pull it apart. Located between the concentric circles are little cavities called lacuna, and that's where the 
bone cells or the osteoblasts and osteocytes are found. Also notice that extending from the central canal to the lacuna and also from one lacuna to another are these tiny little canals called canaliculi. These canaliculi form a transport system allowing substances to be transported from the central canal to nearby osteocytes and then from those osteocytes to other osteocytes farther away from the central canal. To summarize our discussion on the microscopic anatomy of compact bone. Let's now compare the structures on the figure which we use in our discussion to an actual picture, microscopic picture of an osteon. Very similar to the one that you saw in lab. So here are the concentric rings of extracellular matrix of the osteon. Here are the lacuna. The lacuna are the little spaces where the osteocytes are found. They appear dark in color because light cannot penetrate into those small cavities. Located centrally in the osteon is the central canal or Haversian canal. And lastly, the canaliculi are all those little small canals radiating outward from the central canal. In this screencast, you learn to describe the anatomy of a long bone, and you also learn to describe the microscopic anatomy of compact bone tissue. The next screencast will discuss the formation, growth, and development of bones.